hey guys and welcome back to my channel today we're doing another true crime video and we will be talking about the story of any insurance diwani now just a quick disclosure most of this information i took directly from any's father's book any's father wrote a book called any diwani ni head honcho a father's story so most of my information is directly from there and is as accurate as can be one last thing if you like these type of videos definitely check out my true crime playlist without wasting any time let us dive deep into this video any diwani was born on the 12th of march 1982 and her parents say she was born at exactly 6 47 pm at skafta hospital in sweden she's the second born of mother nilam hidhancho and vinod hidhaja she has an older sister named emmy and a younger brother named amish hidhancho they're a very close family that lived in a small town of Sweden called Maristad. She was a true definition of a small town girl with big dreams. Amy went to a local primary school called Flitiga Lesson Primary School with her sister and she also completed her A's and O levels in Voshka School in Maristad. Now those are equivalent to your matric. After completing her A's and O levels, um, Amy decided to move away from Maristad and moved about five hours away from her home and she would start her university career. Her father mentions that during the four years as a student, she changed courses from electric engineering to studying innovation engineering at the University of Hull. Ned, her father says that during this time they worried a lot about her and he'd normally drive down to the university to see her because she had never been away for, from home for so long. In 2006, Nila and her mother was diagnosed with stomach cancer and Amy would drop everything and she decided to dedicate a whole year to helping her mother get back to health. After completing her tertiary education, Amy decided to move in la to London instead of going back to Maristad. She moved in with her favorite cousin, Snare, who was just a year older than her, so they really got along. She got a job at an electronics company called Ericsson in Stockholm, and things were really looking up for Amy. She expressed how she loved the freedom of the capital city and the opportunities that it gave her. On the 27th of November 2009, it was Annie's mother's 58th birthday. Now everyone was back at home in Maristad and Annie had brought back a young man called Shrin. Though it was their first time meeting Shrin, but they actually knew about him. Vinod, who is Annie's father, explains that in Indian families, normally there's a designated aunt somewhere along the ranks whose job is to find suitable par partners for the youngsters. Now, though they don't, they hate to call it arranged marriages, but it's just a nudge in the right direction. And that is what happened between Annie and Shrin. Annie's father says that Shrin made a great impression when he entered the room. He bowed down and touched his wife's feet. Now, Vinod says that touching the feet in their culture is a sign of love and respect and actually a request for the blessings. So Vinod loved this and he was intrigued by the whole relationship, but he decided that he won't be asking the young man too many questions because the relationship was fairly new. So besides Shren making a great impression on Annie's parents, there's just one off thing that he remembers from the party. And that was Annie was trying to get close to Shren a lot by leaning into him and sitting cozy next to him. And Shren would literally seem like he is um, just not being responsive to it or distinctively pushing her away. And he said that he thought that this was maybe because Shrian wanted to be respectful towards Annie's parents. So although it was weird and a little bit off-putting, but he put it off as if Shrian was just trying to be respectful. A month later, Annie was back in Maristad again, and this time it was Christmas. And uh, basically, Annie's mother and father asked her how things were going with Shrian, and Annie would say they're going really well. And Vinod really remembers thinking this is good news to them, because at this time, Annie was 27 years old, and they really wanted her to get married. Soon after Annie had told her parents about this, Prakash and Prakash is Shrian's father called the house and introduced himself and told Annie's father about himself and their prestigious family and basically sold his son to the uh, to the hit honchos. Vinod was very impressed about this phone call and it proved that things were really getting serious and he really loved that for his child. 
Lo and behold, a few months later, Annie called her parents and basically told them that she is engaged and they were ecstatic. Told them how Shuen had actually flew her off to Paris and, in, and presented her with the beautiful diamond ring at the Ritz Hotel after dinner. And Annie's cousin, Snare, had actually assisted Shuen plan the whole thing from buying her a Karen Milan dress and Christian Dior shoes. Shreyan called me and said, I want, to make, I want to surprise Annie. I want to propose to her. And I said, OK, I'm not going to tell Annie. For the first time in my whole life, I didn't. And he booked a private plane. She understood that he was going to take us somewhere, but she didn't know where. So when they arrived to, the, to Paris, and then they went to Hotel Ritz, the food came out, and she was waiting for the ring. And I remember she told me that the ring never came. But in the end, instead of having the dessert, the ring was in the silver plate. She seemed happy about the engagement for a while, but started to share her doubts with her sister and her cousin Sne and mentioned that they have never ever been intimate and every time she had tried, he would basically push her or rub her off. Personally, I think it was quite strange because uh, even if, um, if a guy says that he doesn't want to have sex before marriage, um, it would... Um, you, you kind of think it's strange. Annie also mentioned this to her father, but like all fathers would say, he basically said that he's proud of she and actually that's very respectable of him. Papa, she and is saying like this, I said, you should be very proud of that. I'm very proud of that. What a nice boy. He believes in Hindu culture and... and, uh, and of course I felt... Uh, and I, I commented on that to my daughter. Well, she's born and brought up in Sweden, and she would find that funny. But, but uh, uh, according to Hindu culture and this thing, it gives a respect to the boy. As time went on, though, Annie would add more things to the list of things she did not like about Shren. She said that Shren was acting like a Hitler. He was controlling to the extent of asking her to provide him with a monthly Excel spreadsheet of her spendings. Annie's father found out about this, he was taken aback because Annie was not an overspender, though she came from a wealthy family, but she was not spoiled. Plus, what happened to the pure and simple romance? Why would you ask to monitor your wife to be a person you just literally got engaged to? Despite the misgivings about the whole relationship, the wedding planning went on. They decided they wanted a Hindi wedding in India, which would be followed by a registered official ceremony later on to make it official in the United Kingdom. Annie traveled to Mumbai, India to arrange and plan the wedding. In the Indian culture, it is custom for the bride's family to carry the cost of the wedding. So they did so and did not spare any expenses. Um, they would fly their family and friends from the United Kingdom to, Hin uh, to India and they would book for them. In total, Annie's father spent £150,000 and that is equivalent to 3 million rands in South Africa. They had one big argument in India. Uh, Shriyan came to help Annie to sort out some things for the wedding. And they had an argument and she threw the ring at him and she left the hotel room. And then uh, she wanted to break off at the time. Um, and I remember that night that she did not stay with him. Why would she do that? We asked her and she explained that she, she, was, she didn't want to get married. The next day... Shreyan sent a car uh, to the hotel where she was, where she was staying, and then to go back to him, and they were talking everything through, and then they decided to go ahead with the wedding again. I regret every day that I told her to go back to him and that she was stressed out, and, and because in the end I feel like I'm the one who told her to... to I persuade her to go back to him, and... If I didn't, if I hadn't done that, maybe she wouldn't have gone back to him and maybe she would have been alive today. Nonetheless, the wedding went on and on the wedding day, everything looked absolutely beautiful on the outside. But Annie would go on to her father and complain about him here and there, about how he was treating her in the background. During the wedding, everything looked okay, but she came a couple of times and tells me, Papa, was pushing me at one time, pushing me away or ignoring me. I said, because you both are so 
dance to the wedding and all that. But I, I more than that, I couldn't, I couldn't guess. I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't guess the, that there, there's something wrong then. But uh, flashing back today, things are different, I think. After the wedding, they also slept separately to the extent that Annie would actually call her cousin Snea to come to the room and chill with them because they literally would not sleep together. They weren't intimate on the wedding night as well. And Snea basically said that no, she's not coming to their room. It's their wedding night. They're supposed to spend their time together. The next day, it was a second ceremony, which was slightly more tense for Annie, but she decided she would act her way through it and hopefully things would be fine during their honeymoon. The wedding was finished, it was time for the friends and family to separate and everybody was going back home. Now saying goodbye was pretty tough for Annie's family because um, Annie's father really describes how he cried because he felt like he had lost his child to another man essentially. Nonetheless, they said their goodbyes and Annie mentioned that they did not have any honeymoon plans yet so they'd probably go back to the United Kingdom and plan their honeymoon and go from there. And that was it. Annie's parents decided that they would not call Annie for a while so they gave it about a week and a half before they even tried to contact her. They didn't want to seem like uh, the nagging in-laws to her new husband. And Annie would message her sister during this time telling her that she was crying a lot and literally crying was her new hobby. A week after your marriage is supposed to be the happiest um, time of your life. Uh, you've just newly wed your on our on your way to a honeymoon and I don't understand why she would write a message saying crying is my new hobby something is not right nonetheless things were still moving forward and Shane surprised Annie with tickets to South Africa for their honeymoon and they would board an, a flight from Heathrow Airport all the way to Otamwa Airport in South Africa and their first stop in South Africa would be the Kruger National Park Pictures of them circulated from their time in Kruger National Park and they seemed somewhat happy. From Kruger National Park, their next stop would be Cape Town. They landed at the Cape Town International Airport. Now, instead of using a free shuttle service provided by their hotel, Shireen opted that they use a meter taxi instead and that is where they met a guy named Tongo. Tongo would then become their designated driver for the duration of their stay in Cape Town. They got into the meter taxi and made their way to the waterfront where they booked themselves into the Cape Grace Hotel, which is one of the most expensive hotels in Cape Town that is overlooking the waterfront as well as the mountain. While in Cape Town, Annie would confide in her cousin Snare again, telling her that Shane is a monster and they actually discussed the possibility of a divorce later on, that it's always an option, but you must just see how it works out. They would spend the majority of the first day inside the hotel just resting and then uh, Shane would leave her for a little bit with Tongo to go and try and exchange some money. Now when asked why, uh, why he was going all the way to town to exchange money, he mentioned that no, they had a better rate there. He was just looking for a better exchange rate. Later on, it was disclosed that he was actually going to the black market to exchange the money. Incidentally, while he was away, Vinod and his father called to try and speak to Annie. He said that I'm, I'm in a shopping mall changing money. And then I asked why. He says, oh, it's better rate right here. Okay, where's Annie? Oh, she's in the room getting dressed. Oh, I want to talk to her. Uh, I'll see that she calls you later on. When Shuan got back to the hotel, he told Annie that her father had called and she must call him back, and she did. She would love to talk on the phone. She loved all the time, and this time she was very brief and tense somehow, I gather. She said, Papa, I have so much to tell you. Uh, I'll tell you everything when I come home on Tuesday. And that was the last I heard of her. Less than one hour after the phone call, Tonga would come and pick the couple up and they would go to dinner and sightseeing at night. Shane would let her say that um, Annie wanted to see the real Africa and the real Africa was Guguletu. Tonga would take them to the Strand via Guguletu to a fish and chips restaurant called Surfside. CCTV footage shows them getting into that restaurant 
And his father mentioned that any would never dress like that going to a fish and chips restaurant and definitely would not ask to see the real Africa in the middle of the night. Much discussion between the two of them. Um, I remember uh, she was sitting on, on that chair over there and he was sitting on this side. And they were both basically looking out towards the side because at night time, you know, lights are all the way from here to on the mountain there. So it's quite lit up and it's quite a, quite a nice view. I did notice that they, it must have been a special event for them because, I mean, the way they were dressed and, and you know, normally, you wouldn't normally see people dressed like it in South Africa going out. I think they basically just finished the starters and then, and then they left again. This would be the last video of Annie taken alive. She was walking from the restaurant to Tongo's car. They got into Tonga's car and the assumption was that they were making their way back to the Cape Grace Hotel. They took the same route they took there, which was via Guguletu, but something terrible happened instead. Shrein later describes how they were hijacked and basically the people told him and Tongo to get out of the car at different stops and they left any inside. Shrein would run around Guguletu looking for help from the residents. As I was about to pull in into the garage, I saw this guy staggering, coming towards me. He asked if I can take him to, to the nearest police station. I could tell from his voice that he has been crying. He was neatly dressed. He had a suit on and some nice colorful shirt underneath. Uh, yeah, people have been asking me whether he... He seemed to have been in a fight or something, but I just saw the neatly dressed guy. But uh, by the sound of his voice, he seemed to have been in shock, you know. So, but uh, the dress code, he was like neat and all. The next morning, unfortunately, the police would find Annie's body. She had been killed by a single bullet to the neck. Shren called Annie's father and told him the news, and he took the very first flight to South Africa. Bernard got to Cape Town and he said when he got there, Shin was not acting like someone who was grieving. He was always on his laptop and he didn't cry much. But he thought to himself, maybe he's crying in private or that really people take shock differently. They sorted out the logistics regarding Annie's body and a few days later the body was released and they were allowed to fly back to the United Kingdom. Now the days leading up to the funeral, Shren was acting stranger and stranger by the day. Annie's body was lying there and we were going to do the makeup and he wanted to put on bangles on her and the body is swollen so he was squeezing the bangles on her hand. And then he asked the funeral parlor guy about for some oil. And I said, don't put on the bangles because you're hurting her. And then he just dropped her hand really rough. And uh, I just looked at him and I said, what's happening? What's going on? I can still in my head today hear that cloink when that hand hit the um, metal thing that she was lying on. And it makes me shiver because it seems like he was being rough with Ani and it wasn't gentle and wasn't, it wasn't nice. You don't do that to someone you love. You, you put the hand down slowly. You just don't drop it. Back in South Africa, unbeknown to the people in the UK, the police were building their case against Shrian Diwani. According to the police, Shrian had planned the hit from the very moment they landed in South Africa. He asked Tongo, the meta taxi driver, to get someone to kill Annie on his behalf. Tongo then went to another guy he knew who worked at the Protea Hotel and he asked him if he could arrange for someone to do the hit. They said that they could do it for 15,000 rand and the reason Shen wanted to go to the black market to exchange his money there is because he didn't want a paper trail. So he did not want people to know that he was exchanging money and so much money because it did not make sense why he had so much money cash.
Another piece of information that they revealed was that the reason they even ended up at the weird fish and chips restaurant all the way down in the Strand, which is past Kukuletu, is because the people who were supposed to do the hit were actually late. So they were, they were not ma- supposed to make it all the way the other side in the first place, which is why they only spent 30 minutes there and they had to go back again. Now, the biggest shock of all in terms of the evidence the police had gathered was that Sharon Diwani was actually gay. A guy named the German master actually came up to the police and said that, hey, listen, the guy that you guys have on the news, uh, that honeymoon murder guy, I've been in a relationship with, okay? We've been sleeping together for the longest time back in the UK. So the police really thought they had a slam dunk case because they have a motive now. The reason perhaps this guy is killing his wife is because he's gay. And all they had to do was bring him back to South Africa and they're good to go. Furthermore, the police found that he was registered on so many gay websites that during the time, right after Annie had passed away and he was working on his laptop, he was actually not working, he was chatting away on gay websites. To top matters up, the guys that he paid to murder Annie, including Tongo, who was the driver, actually confessed and they were jailed and sentenced to 15 years or more. So the only thing left to do was to extradite Diwani to come back to South Africa to face his trial. So the South African government requested that Diwani be arrested in London and then they would start with the extradition plan. He was arrested in London and was released on bail. And the South African government would start with a tedious exercise to try and get Diwani back into South Africa. It would take a long, gruesome four years before he would come back to face trial in South Africa. The trial started in October of 2014, but before the trial started, Trent said he had something that he wanted to get off his chest, and he proceeded to speak via his lawyer saying that. I consider myself to be bisexual. My sexual relations with men were mostly physical experiences or email chats with people I met online or in clubs, including prostitutes such as Leotard Laser and the German master. Now, in a few short words, Literally, Shen had debunked and killed the prostitution's case because they were relying on him denying that he's gay. So their whole case was based on the fact that this guy is gay and he's hiding it. And the long and the short of it would be that Shane was acquitted at the end of 2014 and he'd go back to the United Kingdom. In 2018, he started posting pictures of himself and his boyfriend on his social media account and is living openly as a gay man. And that is the end of the video, you guys. Thank you so much for watching. Please remember to like, comment, and subscribe. And if you like these type of videos, definitely check out my playlist for true crime videos. Thank you again for watching. Bye.